From Washington, D.C., this is the Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Hannah Zuberi. First, the headlines. Extremists burn Quran under police protection in Sweden. Israeli forces injure 150 Muslims during Fajr at Al-Aqsa. India demolishes homes and shops of Muslims. Thousands in Pakistan form human chain on anti-Islamophobia day. New York AG launches probe of price gouging by oil companies. Christians, Jewish and Sikh neighbors celebrating festivals. And our top story tonight. On Thursday, the Danish leader of a far-right party burned a copy of the Quran in a heavily populated Muslim area in Sweden. According to media reports, Rasmus Paludan, head of the Stram Cruz party, placed the Muslim holy book down in a public square in the city of Linköping and burnt it. He was accompanied by police. About 200 demonstrators gathered to protest the burning. Protesters urged police to stop Palidan from carrying out the act. After police ignored their calls, violence broke out and the crowd began pelting officers with stones. Mikhail Yuxel, who founded Sweden's Party of Different Colors, has said Islamophobic provocations continue in cities across Sweden. Israeli soldiers stormed Al-Aqsa Mosque's courtyards today, injuring more than 150 Palestinians during Fajr prayer. The Middle East Monitor reports that Israeli police fired a barrage of stun grenades as they beat and shot Palestinians with rubber bullets and used tear gas. Eyewitnesses told Anadolu Agency that the Israeli police pursued worshippers and assaulted them in the mosque's courtyard. Thousands were in attendance for the morning prayer when Israeli police unleashed their violence. A day earlier, three Palestinians died as Israeli forces launched fresh raids in the West Bank district of Jenin. The raids came a week after a gunman from Jenin went on a deadly shooting spree in Tel Aviv. Israel has deployed additional forces in the West Bank and is reinforcing its wall and hence barrier after four deadly attacks claimed 14 lives. In a clash near Jenin on Thursday, two youths died of injuries sustained in an Israeli attack, the Palestinian Health Ministry said. In related news, Israeli far-right groups have called for making animal sacrifices at the Al-Aqsa complex as part of the week-long Passover holiday. Palestinians have warned any sacrifice by Jewish settlers will worsen the situation. Hundreds of Indian police officers demolished Muslim homes with bulldozers in a small Muslim neighborhood in Khargaon City, the BBC reports. Several Muslim homes and shops are being torn down in Madhya Pradesh. Akar Patel, chair of Amnesty International's India board, said such punitive demolition could amount to collective punishment in violation of international human rights law. On April 11, people allegedly raised provocative slogans in front of a mosque during Hindu celebrations, leading to a riot. State Chief Minister Sivraj Singh Chauhan told the media that the rioters had been identified. He said the damages will be recovered from their private or public property. Japan's first mosque joins the rest of the Muslim world in worship during Ramadan this month. Built in 1935, the three-story mosque in Nakayamate Dori in Kobe was designed by Czech architect Jan Josef Svag. It has a central prayer hall on the ground floor and a white marble mihrab and mimbar. The building houses an Islamic cultural center offering study sessions and information about Islam. Jingiro Katsuda, Kobe's mayor at the time, said he hoped that the mosque will be in another strong link in the chain of Muslim-Japanese friendship, according to a report. The mosque survived the Second World War and the devastating 1995 Kobe earthquake unscathed. Cameras, microphones, and smartphones aren't just used to stay in touch with people. Such gadgets have become essential technology for Muslims keeping track of their Ramadan rituals. 
For Omar Taha, they are essential for reaching out to his congregation, the Al-Iman Islamic Center in South London. The 33-year-old physician manages and controls the mosque's finances as a principal trustee. He uses his phone daily to stream the Maghrib Adhan, signaling to his Bromley neighborhood that it's time to break the fast. He also reads the Quran and sets notifications for his five daily prayers from an app. Video conferencing allowed the mosque members to stay connected during the pandemic. Technology continues to aid communications within this and other faith communities. On Thursday, thousands of Pakistanis formed a human chain to commend the UN declaration of March 15th as International Day to Combat Islamophobia. The event took place in the Jung district of Pakistan's northeastern Punjab province. Participants made different formations, including Thank You UN and Islam is Peace, stretching 100 feet each in length and breadth. The event was organized under the umbrella of the Muslim Institute, an Islamabad-based think tank, which has voiced strong opposition to Islamophobia. March 15 marked the day in 2019 when a white supremacist voiceover redo. The event took place in the Jung district of Pakistan's northeastern Punjab province. Participants made different formations, including Thank You UN and Islam is Peace, stretching 100 feet each in length and breadth. The event was organized under the umbrella of the Muslim Institute, an Islamabad-based think tank, which has voiced strong opposition to Islamophobia. March 15th marks the day in 2019 when a white supremacist gunman murdered 51 Muslims at two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. Thousands of displaced Syrians living in tents in the country's northwest province of Idlib are suffering from extreme poverty. Many displaced Syrians are sheltering in the Kafar home camp and struggling to survive during Ramadan. Abu Omar, who's unemployed, and his family cannot afford to buy basic living and food supplies such as oil and potatoes. They live on grass collected from the mountains instead. Idlib falls within a de-escalation zone per an agreement between Turkey and Russia in March 2020. However, the Bashar al-Assad regime has consistently violated the terms, launching frequent attacks inside the zone. China is working as Russian President Vladimir Putin's silent partner in his war against Ukraine, CIA Director William Burns said Thursday. Burns did not elaborate on China's support, but he did say Beijing presents the CIA with the most profound test it has faced in its 75-year history. On Russia's war against Ukraine, Burns said that the scenes of devastation emerging from Mariupol and Kharkiv are reminiscent of the 1994-95 Battle of Grozny. In that battle, Russian forces clamped down on the Chechen capital, leveling dozens of square blocks. The U.S. has criticized China for its refusal to condemn Russia's assault on Ukraine. Washington also warned Beijing against providing the Kremlin with military support. During Ramadan, many Muslims fast from dawn until sunset. To break the fast, Muslims often gather together for communal meals known as iftar. But iftars can sometimes generate a lot of waste, such as disposable silverware and serving items. To combat the problem, a group of 15 Muslims in Washington, D.C. decided to throw an environmentally friendly iftar. That movement, started in 2007, has grown into a national organization committed to helping Muslims live in the environmental spirit of Islam. Green Muslims strive to connect Muslims with nature and environmental stewardship. The organization runs its own youth programming, hosts speakers, and provides educational materials, such as tips for hosting zero-waste iftars. News stories on three festivals of three different religions and more domestic news stories after the break. Stay tuned and we'll be right back after these messages. Friends, 
Our world is pulling together like never before. We're making huge sacrifices to keep one another safe. Scientists are working non-stop to develop COVID-19 vaccines and treatments. A vaccine will get our economies moving. It will tell our loved ones we're safe again. But we have challenges we must address. Right now, huge pharmaceutical companies are keeping the vaccine research a secret. They're deciding how many vaccines get made, how much to charge for them, and who gets vaccinated. This will no doubt leave billions of people behind. Pharma companies are putting profit, not people, first. Yet, billions of dollars of taxpayers' money is funding their work. We cannot let the CEOs of a handful of pharmaceutical companies decide our future. We need a vaccine that everyone can have free of charge, no matter where you live or whether you're rich or you're poor. We need companies to share all their research so we can make enough safe vaccines for everyone. We need a vaccine owned by all of us. To end this COVID-19 pandemic, we need to pull together once more. Mr. Speaker, if I decide to wear a turban, or you decide to wear a cross, or he decides to wear a kippah or a skullcap, or she decides to wear a hijab or a burqa, does that mean that it is open season for right honourable members of this House to make derogatory and divisive remarks about our appearance? For those of us who from a young age have had to endure and face up to being called names such as Towelhead or Taliban or coming from Bongo Bongo land, we can appreciate full well the hurt and pain felt by already vulnerable Muslim women when they are described as looking like bank robbers and letterboxes. So, so rather than hide behind sham and whitewash investigations, when will the Prime Minister finally apologise for his derogatory and racist remarks? Which Racist remarks, Mr. Speaker, which have led to a spike in hate crime. Yeah. And given the increasing prevalence of yeah. such incidents within his party, when will the Prime Minister finally order an inquiry into Islamophobia within the Conservative Party, yeah. something which he and his Chancellor promised on national television? Despite the development of a COVID-19 vaccine, millions around the world will not have access. We need a vaccine that's free and available to everyone, everywhere. It's time for a people's vaccine. I am what hunger looks like in America. I am an eight-year-old girl who's not excited for the last day of school. Because this may be the last time I'll have lunch. Till September. I am a single father of two who works three part-time jobs, and that's still, still not enough to put food on the table. I was created by artificial intelligence from faces of the one in eight Americans who struggle with hunger. Feeding America, 200 food banks strong. Dad, they took over my bedroom. Come on, come on. Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Ah! Dad! You saved me. Dad? Are you okay? I'm fine, dear. Your 
hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. New York's Attorney General Letitia James launched an investigation Thursday to determine whether the fossil fuel industry has engaged in gas price gouging. The investigation is believed to be the first of its kind in the U.S., according to news reports. It will examine the state's supply chain, including major oil companies, crude refineries, pipeline operations, manufacturers, retailers, distributors, and shipping firms. Climate organizer and director of the group Fossil Free Media, Jamie Henn, praised the probe. Hen tweeted the move adds momentum to the growing push for a big oil windfall profits tax. Gas prices have been skyrocketing across the U.S. while oil and gas companies are reporting record-selling profits. The Biden administration and U.S. lawmakers have voiced support for the International Criminal Court's probe of Russia's war crimes in Ukraine. But progressive Democratic Congresswoman Ilhan Omar is calling for the U.S. to break with the hypocrisy that has long defined its policies and actions. In a Washington Post op-ed, Omar of Minnesota said that she would introduce legislation to set the U.S. on a path to joining the global tribunal in The Hague. Without consequences for committing atrocities, the situation will repeat itself in the future, she said. Omar and said, Russian President Vladimir Putin must be charged and held fully accountable for his crimes against humanity by the International Criminal Court. On Thursday, Sikhs gathered to celebrate the Sikh New Year of one of Sikhism's holiest sites in Pakistan. Sikhs worldwide celebrate the Harvest Festival of Baisakhi, observed each year on April 13th or 14th. This year, Baisakhi fell on April 14th. In the United States, the Sikh population is estimated to be around 500,000 people, according to the Sikh Coalition. A resolution introduced in the U.S. House of Representatives on March 28th would make April 14th National Sikh Day, if approved by Congress. The eight-day Jewish holiday of Passover began this evening. Passover commemorates the emancipation of the Israelites from slavery in ancient Egypt led by Prophet Moses, peace be upon him. It is celebrated in the early spring from the 15th through the 22nd of the Hebrew month of Nisan, which falls this year on April 15th to the 23rd, 2022. Christians worldwide will observe the culmination of the Lenten season with the Easter celebration on Sunday. Unlike Christmas, Easter moves around on the calendar but always falls on a Sunday during March or April. The date of Easter is determined by the moon just like Ramadan or Eid. It always falls on the first Sunday after the first full moon. The celebration marks the resurrection of Jesus Christ after its, his crucifixion according to Christian belief. Muslim Network wishes happy holidays to Christians, Sikhs, and Jewish neighbors. Coming up next after the break is our in-depth analysis segment on NATO. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after these messages. Assalamu alaikum. This is Imam Malik Mujahid in Chicago. Just like you, I was moved by that Allahu Akbar lady. She stood her ground, fearful of none, for her hijab and for her education. <laughs> Sisters and brothers, Indian Muslims are facing a genocide. India does not care for Muslim protesting, but it does care for the world opinion. Therefore, we must push the United Nations. The UN has a responsibility to protect. They must prevent genocide. Please sign this UN petition now. Get others to sign. It will help. Trust me, it will help. We need one million signatures, brothers and sisters. Please sign now.
If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Well, before you abuse, criticize and accuse. Walk a mile in my shoes. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Despite the development of a COVID-19 vaccine, millions around the world will not have access. We need a vaccine that's free and available to everyone, everywhere. It's time for a people's vaccine. I am what hunger looks like in America. I am an eight-year-old girl who's not excited for the last day of school. Because this may be the last time I'll have lunch. Till September. I am a single father of two who works three, three part-time part -time jobs, jobs. And, and that's, that's still, still not, not enough, enough to put food on the table. I was created by artificial intelligence from faces of the one in eight Americans who struggle with hunger. Feeding America, 200 food banks strong. Dad, they took over my bedroom. Come on, come on. Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Ah! Dad! You saved me. Dad? Are you okay? I'm fine, dear. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. Welcome back. To discuss NATO, Russia, and nuclear threats, Let's go to Imam Abdul Malik Mujahid. Over to you, Imam Mujahid. Thank you, Hina. Situation is getting dangerous and more dangerous when it comes to nuclear bombs. People are worried about it. Ukraine has bombed a Russian Navy ship, and people are wondering whether it was armed with nuclear bombs. Russia has put its nuclear forces on alert. Americans are buying iodine, thinking it's going to protect them from the nuclear bomb. All of that is going on while nuclear weapons are still not used. But CIA says, its director has warned that Putin's desperation over Russia's failure in Ukraine might push them to use nuclear bomb on Ukraine. God forbid. To discuss all of that with us is Greg Mello. Welcome to Muslim Network TV. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Greg Mello is executive director and uh, co-founder of Los Alamo Alamos Study Group. Uh, tell us. Uh, why people are talking so much about the risk of nuclear warfare? Russia, uh, of course, is um, one of the, with the United States, the main nuclear powers in the world. The Russia has a much smaller conventional force than does NATO. NATO has been arming Ukraine uh, and now um, Russia is uh, 
so there's a disparity of conventional forces if NATO gets involved in it beyond what they're doing already. So there is a concern, we have a concern, that Russia will fall back on its nuclear arsenal. The, this war is a, has many uncertainties and uh, opacities uh, associated with it. So we, there, uh, the situation could spiral out of control in Ukraine. And then there's the longer term with traditionally neutral countries like Finland and Sweden talking about joining NATO, which is a nuclear alliance. So uh, putting in effect um, more decision-making voices um, in the room. So the United States would be then obligated to defend uh, Finland, for example, um, and uh, which is not the case at present. So the situation gets more complicated and more fraught. Uh, it's not very far from NATO countries to Moscow. The Russians have been really crying out that the uh, proximity of Ukraine, as well as uh, Poland and Romania, to Moscow, to St. Petersburg, and of course, if Finland were to join NATO, then there would be another potential source of an attack vector to Russia from Finland. Um, it's not very far. It's, you know, a couple of minutes flight time. So Russia's response time would be, and the time in, that Russia would have to evaluate a threat is reduced to almost nothing. So this means that things acquire a hair trigger quality. So that's, you know, part of the concern. So Russia uh, argument, which is considered a propaganda uh, by many here that, well, Russia wants to have a secure border and is concerned for its legitimate security. So you seems to support uh, that particular consideration. I do. Um, really, um, the principle of common security that no one is really secure until everyone is secure uh, something, is something that we have lost track of, both in the Middle East and now in Eastern Europe. The United States very much sees uh, Ukraine as a weapon, really. We've weaponized Ukraine in order to uh, harm Russia, uh, to... Uh, break Russia, and that's the word that uh, Henry Kissinger used. So I think Russia does have some very legitimate concerns, and they explained them very carefully. But because the, the United States, with NATO behind it, doesn't really want peace at this point, unless peace comes with the defeat of Russia. So do you think more Russia is cornered, more they are pushed back, more they are defeated, the higher the chance that they may use nuclear arsenal? Yes. Um, the Russia is, I think that I'm in Washington DC right now. And the I think the feeling here is that the United States is very strong and Russia is, weak overall, uh, and that Russia will eventually bend and be defeated if we can just pile the pressure on. Well, I don't really see it that way. I, um, Russia is a very large country. The, um, the people uh, have a higher tolerance for privation uh, and than we do here in the United States. And they are not going to, they have recent memory of being economically crushed by the West. And I think all those factors mean that it's going to be unrealistic to think that Russia is going to be defeated. 
So we have one, we have the United States uh, thinking that if we can just pile a pressure on, Russia will fall apart. Um, but that pressure could have really quite an opposite effect and could really harm us. And of course, we haven't talked yet about the economic impacts of this, especially on Europe, but also on the United States. And the and I should add, countries which, uh, which is many countries that depend on Russian uh, and Ukrainian wheat and fertilizer. The supply chains of the world are, are delicate in some ways. So the advantage uh, Russia demonstrated through its hypersonic uh, weapons, don't you think that's sort of counterbalance for NATO with nuclear power being on its border? To some extent. So the Russians are ahead in missile technology, but this doesn't make up for the fact that NATO overall military expenses are uh, what NATO countries are spending on their militaries is, I just looked this up, uh, 16 times what Russia spends. NATO, The NATO alliance spends more on its military than the entire rest of the world put together. So our view is that uh, uh, we've seen NATO's aggression, of, uh, I just have to flat out say it, in Bosnia, in uh, Kosovo, in Libya, in Middle East, in uh, Afghanistan. Um, NATO has morphed since the end of the Cold War into a really quite aggressive organization. And Russia sees that. And Russia does not want a unipolar world where basically one country makes the rules. What is being done in terms of um, world leaders to think of peace somehow, the coexistence, somehow not pushing Russia to the level that nuclear bomb becomes their solution? That is such a good question. And I'm not sure that I see a great deal. Um, you are perhaps better informed than I. Turkey has tried to intervene. Um, President Macron uh, recently tried, uh, took President Biden to task for using, for calling Russia's actions genocidal, trying to dial down the rhetoric. Uh, we need to see statesmanship from, uh, from neutral countries. Well, we see some in India, for example. Uh, countries that are refusing to join uh, the club of uh, sanctions against Russia. Um, yeah, but I'm uh, here in the West, we don't get all the news about these uh, peace efforts that we should and if they exist. What happened to this good old peace movement in this country? Oh, my goodness. Um, that is a very penetrating question. Um, we are part of that, um, our small organization. There has been a suborning of the US peace movement by uh, liberal foundations, funding sources. Um, there's been a tendency on part of many organizations to align with the Democratic Party solely and become, in effect, captured by one of the two major parties. Uh, and there's a certain amount of discouragement that took place uh, after the uh, failure to stop the war against Iraq. Uh, and then uh, many people thought that Barack Obama was going to be more peace oriented than he was. Uh, and we failed to recruit the young people that we should be recruiting. So I don't know, those are some of the factors. Well, thank you so much, uh, Greg Miller, for your time. Truly appreciate it. Thank you very much and best wishes. Back to you, Hina.
Thank you so much, Imam Jahid. That's all from our Washington studios tonight. Thank you for tuning in. You can find previous episodes and more on our YouTube or Facebook. For more content, keep watching Muslim Network TV or visit muslimnetwork.tv. Assalamu alaikum and Juma Mubarak.